The available data in Kenya shows approximately 6,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer yearly. Of these, 2,500 women die within the first or second year of diagnosis. We are at the Nairobi Hospital to find out more. Come with us. Hello and welcome to another segment with the Nairobi Hospital. Today I'm joined by Dr. Andrew Thiambo, who is at the Cancer Center at the Nairobi Hospital. Karibu Daktari. Thank you so much, Mavani. Today we will be discussing about breast cancer. And our first question would be, what are some of the symptoms of breast cancer? Let me start by first just talking about the impact of, of the disease so that it will come into perspective. So breast cancer is the commonest cancer in uh, women in Kenya and we get about 6,000 new cases every year. It is estimated that about 2,500 of those will die the same year or the next uh, solely because of having a late diagnosis. And um, we really want to make a lot of noise about breast cancer in October and not only October but throughout so that we get the patients early. Um, we want to get breast cancer when there are no symptoms. That way maybe you will be very early stage, maybe stage one, and then the treatment is very simple. But once you wait for symptoms to crop up, most likely it will be stage three or four. The most common symptoms are, um, one is a breast lump, and it's usually a painless breast lump. Um, that's the most common symptom. So you get stories of women telling you I was having a shower, then I felt something very hard in my breast and then when I went to get checked, it turned out to be breast cancer. Number two, you could have um, changing of the skin over the breast, maybe if it's redness or dimpling or you get like a wound in the breast or any changes in the nipple, maybe the nipple is growing back in or it's changing shape or if you're having any nipple discharge, all those could be signs of breast cancer. Sometimes you have swellings not really in the breast but more in the armpit or on the upper part of the neck. Those could also be signs and symptoms of breast cancer and therefore it's very important that whenever you get any changes in your breast, you go to the hospital to be checked. Mm. Are men also exposed to this type of uh, cancer? So men also get breast cancer. Um, it's about 0.5 to 1% of all the cases. Though it's not common, it happens. I have seen several cases, both young men, but it's more common in the older men over 75 years. But we have seen rare cases of breast cancer in men as, as, as young as 39, 35 years of age. So where do they feel the lump? So for men, it's a bit different because they don't have a lot of breast tissue. So their breast just changes shape or you get a very obvious lump and it's not something you can really ignore. The majority of them will be diagnosed uh, fairly early because it's very obvious that you have a swelling. It's more difficult in the man who is more obese and they have already large breasts by that fact. So those ones it's a bit harder but for the lean men it's very easy. You just get abnormalities in the shape of the breast or the nipple or discharge or swellings in the armpit and in the upper part of the neck. You mentioned that in Kenya, 6,000 women are diagnosed. That's, with that's an estimate. Um, we don't have our cancer registry data well streamlined. It could be more um, because of under-reporting, but that's the figure that we are estimating from the, from the global can, uh, our data of, of statistics who have given us those estimates. For this year, how has the trend been in terms of diagnosis? Are we seeing more people coming in for tests or less? I would say it's pretty much the same. This year we've had ups and downs because of COVID and lockdowns and, and, and reduced access to care. Um, majority of women are still very scared of going for screening, especially when they don't have any symptoms. Um, even when they know they could be at risk, maybe their sister was diagnosed with breast cancer last year or the mother had breast cancer and it's because of fear. And um, fear, for cancer is not unusual. 
everybody's afraid of cancer, myself included. Um, the only way to get out of that loop is to empower yourself with knowledge. The more you know about something, the less ignorant you'll be about it. And when you're less ignorant about something, you will have less fear. And when you have less fear, you have less stigma. So you're like, okay, this is something that, you know, I can do and I know the importance. I know that if I get tested, I can have treatment and I know that I can actually have a good outcome. But if you do not know anything about breast cancer, you, you are so scared. You just imagine that everyone's going to lose their breast. You know, not everybody has to lose their breast because now we have breast conserving surgery. So you can actually be diagnosed with early breast cancer, have your lump removed, retain your breast, complete your treatment and look normal thereafter. But many people, they don't know that because they imagine that you have to lose your breast during treatment. So a lot of empowering of, of knowledge and just going out there to seek uh, uh, knowledge for yourself really improves the outcomes. We actually emphasize this in our guidelines, both locally and internationally, that whenever any woman presents to hospital for any reason, whether you have acne or a UTI, or you're pregnant, or you're just going for a dental check, you should be offered information on breast cancer, and you should be offered or given an opportunity for screening in any setting. So that way we'll be able to get more women empowered with knowledge and hopefully increase the number of women who are coming out for screening. Other than the fear of getting to know that you have cancer for a woman, could, could the price or the, the charges in terms of getting a screen be one uh, hindering factor? That's very true. Obviously, um, economics plays a big role in cancer screening and generally in healthcare in the country. Many women, especially in the low socioeconomic status or, or categories, they cannot afford even a decent meal a day. And so if you tell them that a mammogram costs even a thousand shillings, they'd be like, I'm sorry, I can't afford. I would love to come for screening, but it's just too expensive. Screening actually should be, should be something that the government should do for its citizens for free. It is happening in many other parts of the world, rather, America, Northern Europe. Screening is actually free. When I was in UK, it was very seamless, where you just get a letter in your mail and you're told your appointment for your mammogram is on this day, please show up. And you're like, oh, it's, it's already time. Then you just go. No exchanging of money, nothing. You just go in, get your mammogram. If it's good, you're told, come back next year. If it's abnormal, then you go through the pathway and then you get an early diagnosis. And in those, parts of the world, majority of the cases are actually stage one and two. And that's where their survival is way, way, way longer than ours. What are some of the risk factors associated with breast cancer? I think the most important fact is majority of times there is no risk factor. Up to two thirds of the cases we see, um, the women do not report any known risk factors for breast cancer. So you should uh, go home knowing that majority of times there is no risk factor. Having said that, the most common risk factors for breast cancer are one, increasing age. So the older you become, the more likely you are to develop breast cancer. And not only breast cancer, many other cancers come with age, the same way with prostate cancer and colon cancer and so on and so forth. Number two is family history. Having an auntie, a mother, a grandmother with breast cancer puts you at a higher risk of developing breast cancer. But it's important to remember that the fact that you have no family history does not mean that you are not at risk. Many women imagine that uh, breast cancer is only in families and if my family doesn't have breast cancer, then I'm okay, I don't need to go for screening. The answer is no, you do need to go for screening because breast cancer can occur even if there's nobody in your family who has it. The third group of risk factors are to do with um, um, hormonal factors and more so the presence of the female hormone called estrogen. So when you have long-term exposure to estrogen, it is thought that your risk for breast cancer could be higher. And by this, I mean having menarche at a very early age and having menopause at a very late age kind of puts you at a higher risk of breast cancer. If you have fewer children or if you have your first child after the age of 30, that puts you at a higher risk of breast cancer. 
Even if you have children and you breastfeed for a shorter time than required, then it is thought that your risk for breast cancer is much higher. However, having said that, I have seen patients with breast cancer in women who've had 10 children and have breastfed each of them for more than a year. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you fall in that category, then you'll get breast cancer. Or if you don't have those factors, then you will not uh, get it. Um, another important risk factor is obesity. And obesity doesn't only put you at risk for breast cancer, but it puts you at risk for other cancers like ovary, cancer of the uterus, many other cancers that affect the blood system. Some even puts you at risk for lung cancer, for colon cancer, and so on and so forth. So obesity is an important risk factor that we need to, to look out for. Um, there's a lot of controversy about diet and, and, and whether diet plays any role in causing breast cancer. But to the best of my knowledge and to the best of all the high quality research that we have available, we have not seen any constant uh, link or association between any type of diet or lack thereof with causing breast cancer. We have seen some trends, maybe somebody might tell you that if I take more of this vitamin then I get less of this cancer, but it's really here nor there. I would say for our African population, majority of the time we do not know why women are getting breast cancer. Even the young ones, we are treating patients as early as 25 years of age with very advanced breast cancer. We have a lot of patients between the ages of 30 and 40. If you go up north to the US and uh, to Europe and, and the UK, majority of the patients are old you know, it's 60s, 70s, that's where the bigger portion of their patients are. While ours would be um, late 20s, majority of them being uh, between 30 and 40, and actually 40 and 50 is quite the bulk of the patients. So that really goes to tell you that there's something different between the type of cancers we get from the one that we see uh, uh, in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the various treatment options that we have when treating breast cancer and also the ones that are present at the Nairobi Hospital? So I would say at the Nairobi Hospital we have um, all the modalities that are used to treat breast cancer and breast cancer is not treated by one person. A breast cancer patient will have many doctors and that is called a multidisciplinary team. So it will be consisting of a breast surgeon, it will be consisting of a radiation oncologist, it will be consisting of a medical oncologist like myself. You need a team of oncology pharmacists, oncology nurses, nutritionists, psychotherapists. It's a whole entire team to give the patient holistic care. It's not just a matter of go to surgery, go to chemo, finish and go home. There's a lot of psychosocial aspect that needs to be looked into. There's a lot of dietary advice that the patients need. There's a lot of care the patients need from the pharmacy point of view so that they can get all round care. To dive into the uh, uh, exact modalities, number one is breast cancer surgery, which we have at the hospital. There are many trained surgeons. Uh, uh, who are able to conduct breast cancer surgery and they are able to do both what we call breast conserving surgery as well as the traditional mastectomy where you have to take out your whole breast and it will really depend on what stage you are diagnosed at. If you have early breast cancer you can go through the full treatment without losing your breast so that after finishing you just look like a normal person. If you do have to lose your breast for any reason we have services for reconstruction whereby the plastic surgeons can construct a new breast for you either using your muscles and, and, and fat or using uh, silicone implants or That's any other That's done in implants. Kenya? Yeah, oh. it's done for a long time. It's not just now, for many years it's, it's I, been done. I, I have a feeling it's not that affordable. That's why it's not known uh, to the masses. Yes, that's true. But um, I think for a woman when you're making those tough choices and you're told you know these are the options we have you can actually lose your breast and plan for a reconstruction later if and when funds become available or you're in a much better situation so that we plan for it later so that eventually when we are done then you look you know presentable and you look um, normal and you retain your womanhood 
for majority of the older women, they're not so interested in keeping their breast or they're just like, take it out. I can do the mastectomy bra and have, um, you know, um, um, the, um, a mastectomy like bra. Like it's padded. Yeah, so it has a pad, the shape of a breast, which you can put in. So when you wear your bra, then you look like it's symmetrical. And that's really important for, for a woman's image, which is also available at the hospital. And then when you look at the options of chemotherapy, we have all the range of chemotherapy options available for all the different subtypes of breast cancer, including the newer targeted treatments that we now use for patients with advanced breast cancer. When you look at the radiation uh, techniques that we have, we have the latest techniques now at the hospital that are able to deliver you know, very specific targeted radiotherapy that is required for treating uh, breast cancer. So um, I think in a nutshell, that is how the treatment landscape looks like. And um, there's really no reason for a patient to go and seek uh, treatment outside the country for breast cancer because we have really all the technology around to deal with the cases. Uh, for the next step, I would like you to take us through self-examination of breast cancer. It is important to conduct self-breast examination as frequently as possible. Um, for a woman, you may just stumble upon a lump and that action might be the one that saves your life. Now, we recommend that you do it at least once a month. Usually, they say five to seven days after the end of your menstrual period so that you're not examining your breasts either during menses or just before because of the changes that come with the breast. Obviously, if you're postmenopausal, then it really doesn't matter. But those who are premenopause, we recommend about five to seven days after the end of your period. You could start by first standing in front of a mirror. Obviously, you have to remove all your clothes. Look at the mirror with your hands uh, on the side. Look for any changes in symmetry. Look for any obvious changes in the breast, any differences in size, whether the nipples are in the correct uh, position. Just looking at the mirror and just seeing whether there's anything different from one side to another, okay? And then the next thing you do is you put your hands on, on your side to try and kind of lift the breasts up. Sometimes when one sticks down or doesn't come up the way it's supposed to be, that could imply that there are some problems, okay? Then you can turn sideways, look on the side, again, look on the side, and then proceed to lie on a flat surface so that you can begin now the palpation or the actual checking of your breast. So when you lie down, the reason you lie down is because you have to press against a firm surface, which is your chest, which will increase your chances of finding something. Sometimes we doctors do it very quickly when you're seated because we know how to, to go around the different areas. But for yourself, it's better you lie down. You can put the other arm behind your head so that you increase the surface area. And then whichever motion you use, whether it's circular or up and down, try to cover all the areas of the breast using a circular motion. So you just go round like that, round coming down like that, and you press quite firmly until you can feel your ribs. There's usually some heavy consistency with the breast, but when you feel a lump, it will be something very hard. Sometimes it may be fixed to the chest wall, so that if you detect anything, then you'll be able to know. And then you go all the way up into the armpit, try to dig your hands deep in, but then you can also come below the collarbone and above the collarbone just to feel if there's anything. And then you can finish by gently pressing your nipple to see whether there's any discharge coming out. And if you get anything red, then you know you need to go to the doctor very quickly. And then you change size, okay? And do the same thing. Use the motions, go up, down, and then up, and then down and then you finish with the amp and then you come up there and so on and so forth. And then, um, this particular technique I tell some of my patients to do because I find they find it easier, is actually now jump into the shower and then now when you're actually with soap and everything because I think the soap kind of makes the skin a little softer and lighter so you're able to actually now go into the heavy parts with more, uh, uh, um, 
I don't know whether it's more sensitivity or whatever, but uh, patients have been taught to find lumps easier when there's a mixture of soap and water so that it becomes a daily routine. And then if you find anything, just present yourself to the doctor so that we can order the necessary tests. Many times, some of even my friends, they come and they're like, oh, I was in the shower and I felt something and I'm scared and I think it's breast cancer. So they rush to the clinic, we do the ultrasound and we find out it's a benign lump because actually nine out of 10 breast lumps are not cancer. So, but it's important that you know and there's no way at home you can know that it's breast cancer or not. Just come in for the diagnosis to clear, for clear clarity. What advice would you have for persons who are taking care of a cancer patient and this cancer patient is at the end stage of life? Very interesting question. So a patient who is on the later stages of their cancer has very many needs that they require and a lot of them surround um, maintaining a very high level of dignity. And by dignity, we mean we want the patient to be pain-free. We want the patient to have a high level of cleanliness, nutrition, and so on. So we, we, we would advise that such a caregiver uh, um, um, get the help of home care nursing services because sometimes it's difficult for them to know what to do by themselves. They might not know when the patient is in pain and they might not know what to do, so they actually need a lot of help, both from the doctor, from the palliative care specialists, and from the nurses who are able to attend to patients at home. And majority of these patients, we like for them to be attended to at home, rather than in hospital, because hospital, um, the demands of the services might not really meet your needs, because you really need almost 24 hour uh, kind of surveillance and care. So the advice I'd give to these caregivers is seek the services of, of home care nursing experts because they'll be able to walk you through uh, the journey of this patient as you take care of them at home. There are many myths surrounding Marta's breast cancer. One of them, I've heard people saying, oh, by warming food using the microwave due to the radiation, I'm susceptible to getting breast cancer. So what are the myths that uh, you can demystify for us today so, about breast so cancer? So let me, thanks for that very important question because many people stand by these myths and majority of them are actually not true. So the most common myth is if my family does not have breast cancer, then I will not get it. Therefore, I don't need to be screened. It's false. You need to get checked whether you have breast cancer in your family or not. Number two is that breast cancer only affects older women. That is false. We see breast cancer in even younger women below the age of 40. So it's important to go for checkup. Number three is breast cancer is treated all in the same way. That is false because we have many different subtypes of breast cancer and their treatments will differ depending on the subtype that you have. Number four is having a sugar, excess sugar in your diet causes breast cancer. That is false. We haven't seen any association with um, sugar as a direct cause for breast cancer. What we know is that sugar can increase your rates of obesity and then therefore obesity then becomes the risk factor for breast cancer. We have theories surrounding um, using of antiperspirant uh, deodorants and whether that can give you breast cancer. I think from all the evidence that has been collected so far, um, we do not think that is um, something true. There's also the myth surrounding microwaved food and uh, living next to a, a safari com tower next to your house and having radiation all over you. Some of them are difficult to prove or disprove, but we, we also see cancer from uh, areas where there's very little technology and no microwaves and no anything. And we still see cases of breast cancer and even other cancers uh, from that region. Actually, uh, Professor Binya and myself, we were part of the team that we did the research at KNH where we found that um, um, wearing uh, braziers for long hours may actually put you at risk. Although this has not been tried and tested, it was just an observation. Um, so I can't say so much about it uh, now because nobody else has observed yeah, it. Because I'm trying in, to in think other what's the association of wearing it it's, for long it's, and... It's, it's more about 
um, the, the lymphatic drainage and how the breast needs time to breathe. You know, there are people who even wear the bra in bed asleep at night and that's just too, it's too long. But maybe we'll continue uh, exploring that, that angle. But yeah, it's just an observation. As you've heard, breast cancer can be treated and one can lead a normal life. Early diagnosis remains key in the treatment of breast cancer. And good news is that all treatment facilities can be available locally. I'm Odhani Waweru at the Nairobi Hospital.